great to be here, everybody. Um, to sort of quickly reintroduce myself, my name is Blaine Hoke. I'm a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm also a PhD research intern at Visa Research on the Trustworthy AI team. Today, I'm very excited to talk to you about our work, The Space of Adversarial Strategies, which explores when and why attacks are performant. This work was uh, done in collaboration with my co-first author, Ryan Sheetsley, along with Eric Pauly and our advisor, Dr. Patrick McDaniel. As we've all seen, the field of adversarial machine learning has expanded rapidly, so much so that we now have entire conferences dedicated to advancing the state of AML in surrounding areas. With each new iteration of papers we see in the security space, we get introduced to new techniques that either defend against or defeat techniques introduced in the iteration prior. Thanks to this cat and mouse game that we've observed between attacks and defenses, the attack space has quite literally exploded into a plethora of different algorithms. Yet, even with all of these attacks, it's difficult to say what we've actually learned about crafting adversarial examples, both from a perspective of what is advantageous for an attacker or a defender to use, but also from the perspective of where this disconnect between human classification and model classification actually starts diverging. But in order to make progress on both of these fronts, we not only need a more systematic way of designing and representing attacks, but we also need a methodology that allows for fair and clear comparison between attacks so that we can begin to understand what works well and why. We begin the systemization by breaking down seminal attacks in adversarial machine learning, a few of which are shown here. By identifying the similarities and differences between these algorithms, we can begin to form a generalization of what makes an attack an attack. Our first observation in this work is that all attacks follow a common pattern. That is, that portions of these attack algorithms contain surfaces, which compute perturbations, as well as travelers, which apply those perturbations, as well as other techniques that update the input and aid in optimization. Clearly though, just looking at the diversity of what's highlighted in these boxes here, there are many different ways to go about computing perturbations and applying them, and tons of tricks that have been introduced in the last few years. So my collaborators and I wanted to start breaking down each one of these one level deeper to understand what kinds of techniques or components are, exist in the travelers and surfaces that we know today. Ultimately, we were able to produce our decomposition of attacks that we introduce in this work. With this decomposition, we have a generalization of what makes an attack an attack. This allows us to represent attacks as sets of components and component choices, rather than as their own unique individual entities, which can often make it difficult to compare attacks to each other fairly. Uh, in a little bit, I'll discuss more about what we actually do with this decomposition and some of the key properties that we get from it. But for now, I'll just run through a quick example of how this decomposition actually works. So I'll show you how uh, PGD and DeepFool, two popular attacks that are very different, are defined under this framework. Throughout this example that I'm about to go through, I'll leave up these two figures here. On the left, we have our decomposition chart that I just showed. And then on the right here, we have a chart that contains a row for each attack that we looked at in this work for the purposes of creating our decomposition. And then each column that we have here is a different component choice that we've identified through our decomposition. The, high, or the filled in bubbles represent the fact that that attack uses that component choice. Throughout this example, I'll highlight the relevant parts of this chart so that you can follow along. So back to our PGD deep fool example, beginning in the surface and with the loss component, we see that PGD opts for the categorical cross entropy loss and takes its gradients from the output of this loss function. Deepful, on the other hand, doesn't use an explicit loss function, so we say that it, it optimizes over the identity loss. Instead, it takes the Y-truth component of the model Jacobian and operates on that directly. Moving down into the saliency map component of our decomposition in the surface, we see that PGD doesn't apply any special heuristics or tricks or saliency maps and just operates on its, uh, its categorical cross entropy gradients as is, while DeepFool applies a linear approximation of projection onto the decision boundary, which we call the DeepFool saliency map. PGD, on the other hand, uh, since it doesn't do anything, we say that it uh, operates on the identity saliency map. This DeepFool saliency map, in the case of the exact 
deep fool equation also encodes the L2 norm, whereas PGD opts for the sine function times the step size, which is consistent with L infinity attacks. Moving over into the traveler part of our decomposition, we see that PGD employs the use of random restart, meaning that it chooses to start from a random point within the epsilon norm ball of the original input. Deep fool simply starts from the original input as is. Neither of these attacks uh, employ the change of variables operation identified in the Carlini-Wagner attack. So moving on to the optimizer class, we see that PGD and deep fool both have an identical update step where they simply take their perturbation that was computed in the steps before, add it to the current input to get the most updated adversarial examples. As you can see from these examples, this decomposition allows us to represent attacks as a succinct set of component choices and components. The framework that we've laid out here has two key properties, the first being that it's extensible. What I mean by this is as new performant techniques get introduced, we can expand our decomposition to account for them, both in the sense that we could add component choices to the components that we've identified here, such as a new loss function in the loss component, or we can form entirely new components as well. The second key property that we get from this decomposition is that all of the components that we've identified here are mutually compatible and independent from one another. What I mean by this is just because we select let's say an atom optimizer in an attack that we wanna build, doesn't mean that we have to use the cross entropy loss in the loss component. It's the second key property that we exploit to enumerate over all possible permutations of different attack components to build a vast attack space consisting of 576 attacks, over 560 of which were previously unexplored before this work. Now that we have a vast attack space to evaluate on, we need a way to fairly measure attack performance. To do this, we introduce what we call the Pareto Ensemble Attack, or the PEA for short. The PEA is a theoretical attack that upper bounds attack performance. Specifically, it's defined as the lower envelope of the accuracy budget space for all of the attacks that we evaluated in this work. Thus, we can use the PEA to quantify attack performance by taking the difference of the areas between these two curves, or in other words, the area above the PEA with each attack to say how optimal it is. Since the PEA represents the most optimal an attack can be out of all of these attacks that we evaluate, we say that the closer an attack is to tracking the PEA, the more optimal it is. So in this case, A3 would be the most optimal attack, and then A1 and then A2 based on their areas. Okay, so now that we have our 576 attacks and we've run all of them, we got our PEA, we calculated all of the area differences with the PEA for every single one of our attacks, we can now begin our evaluation. In our work, we assume a white box setting, so the adversary has full access to the model parameters and can perform white box attacks. We evaluate on seven different data sets spanning a wide variety of different phenomena, including object classification, network intrusion detection, malware detection, and phishing detection. In the original paper, we have a wide variety of experiments and research questions that we look at. Just for the interest of time, I'll just go through my personal favorite one, which asks the question, when and why are attacks performant? In this experiment, we really wanted to understand if we could attribute attack performance to any single component in the sense that we wanted to know, are certain attacks better because they use the SGD optimizer instead of the atom optimizer or random restart versus not using random restart and so on and so forth. So in order to investigate this, we conducted hypothesis testing. This hypothesis testing consisted of making hypotheses out of comparison statements between two different component choices that live within the same component class, such as SGD is better than atom, and then taking these hypotheses and comparing them against various conditions. The conditions that we looked at spanned from using a particular data set to uh, also being contingent on the use of different component choices, such as ensuring that random restart was used and so on and so forth. All in all, we ended up evaluating nearly 1,700 hypotheses and then trimmed down from there based on what, what was statistically significant. 
So here I'll just show a couple of interesting trends that we found from our hypothesis testing. Uh, one of my favorite parts of this experiment was the fact that we were actually able to validate uh, con confirm the validity of some commonly held best practices for making good attacks. In uh, one example that I have here, we saw that random restart did indeed help. Uh, that supports common claims that people have, have used for how to make good attacks. We saw that 61% of the hypotheses that we investigated, of the statistically significant hypotheses that we investigated, 61% uh, of them were in favor of using random restart. The other thing that I uh, really liked about this experiment in particular is that we also got to uncover some new, interesting, and somewhat unexpected trends. For example, looking at the loss component, we saw that identity loss was actually the most favored loss function, even beating out cross-entropy loss by a whopping 13%. I'll remind you that the identity loss here is consistent with, is the same as using no loss at all. Finally, uh, in support of open and reproducible research, we make all of the code for the strategies framework available at the following URL. And finally, I will just wrap up by saying thank you so much to all of my collaborators. Without them, this work would not have been possible. And uh, thank you all so much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions.